Hello, my friend, and welcome back. And uh, this part, I'm really excited about this part because, uh, in part, some of this is actually recorded and already on my YouTube channel. I actually recorded some of the asset register videos previously uh, because it's so important to cybersecurity in, in ICS OT environments. But we've also updated the sections, uh, particularly concerning to when we look at performing active scanning. So we're going to look at using tools like Nmap in an ICS OT environment, which we typically say we don't do, but there could be a time and place for it, potentially. And then, so it also borders on talking about you know, penetration testing in ICS OT environments. So, so the section is not as boring on the surface as it seems to be because asset registers, no one's ever going to say is like a fun, sexy topic to, to talk about. But not only are we going to talk about active scanning in the environments, but we're also going to talk about passive listening, which really builds into a network intrusion detection conversation or network security monitoring, right? How do we find the bad people on the network if we're not looking for them, right? So we need to be looking at, and we need to be looking at network traffic, and we can look at network traffic as one way to determine you know, what type of assets do we have in the environment. That's really what this section is going to be about. But it's going to be one of those other long, long sections, but hopefully in in a good way. So, and let's just jump in right after our disclaimer, because right? everything we're talking about in 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 the course is, is for informational purposes only, right? Uh, to help you in your environments uh, become more, more secure. So here's the agenda for this part. So again, we're going to talk about asset registers. And, and if you're not familiar with the term asset registers, which I was not coming into OT from IT. And it, I mean, it sounds like we're talking about asset inventory, but why wouldn't we call it asset inventory? Um, it's a good question. They just call it asset registers in, in OT. So it, it, it's exactly what we're talking about. So when we say asset register in OT, it just means it's an as, asset inventory. It's just a list of the assets that we have in the environment. It just looks probably slightly different than what we would have in IT, where IT is primarily computers, right, with workstations and servers and, and laptops. And, and while we have some of those in the OT, right, we also have things like programmable logic controllers, our PLCs, and other types of OT assets that are going to be in that inventory or on that asset register that, that we're not going to see in IT. So we're going to look at how we build that asset register and, and the four main ways that we can do that. So if especially if you go into, let's say, an environment that's existed for, say, 10 plus years, and they don't have an asset register, how are you going to, to build that? And so that's where we can talk about doing things like walking the environment, right? Tracing cables to, to actually find those assets and, and add them to a list. We can do active scanning. And when we talk about doing network mapping using a tool like, like Nmap, that's usually going to be the one that, that people are still going to use, even though there, there could be some risks there. So, so there's some ways to limit that, that risk. And there are other tools out there, and we'll talk about some. We talk about active versus passive scanning. I hate the term passive scanning because, well, passive scanning, we're not scanning anything. So why why do we call it that? So that's really where it's it's more like passive listening and where we're capturing traffic on the network to review, to see, oh, okay, what hosts are out there and what are they talking? So, and I have some new PLCs in my, my home lab, so we'll actually get to see the traffic generated by those. So I'm excited to, to get to get to play with those and, and show those off a little bit. So um, we talk about there's there's other types of documents out there that we can pull information from. So the change management process is one of them, uh, maybe in procurement, right? It, you We've bought these PLCs, so hopefully we have a receipt somewhere and that we're able to find that receipt and then be able to use that to, to add it to our asset register. So that's, there's a couple options that we're going to talk about there. Uh, also things like PLC programming code uh, that we're going to talk about, project uh, and program data 
right? Those are all places where asset information can hide that, that we want to find. Uh, and then after that, we're going to come back and, and you see monitoring the control system state. That's actually what I built my master's thesis on. So I'm not going to bore you with the whole, uh, I think it came out to be about 30 pages. So it's not too crazy. Uh, it's not too much. Um, but but we'll get, a, get an idea of why it's important to understand uh, when we look at, the, especially the PLCs in our environment. Right, and and trying to understand when they're secure, when they're in a safe state, versus when they're in a uh, unsecure or a vulnerable state, and and it's not as cut and dry as a lot of people in the industry will will make it sound, and that's really the point of the the thesis. So, and then ultimately we'll wrap up. But once we have this asset asset register, uh, or as we're building this asset register, which which more than likely, honestly, is probably just a bunch of inventory data in an Excel spreadsheet, nothing fancy. Uh, but we have to make sure we keep it safe because if an attacker was able to gain access to that asset register, especially if they have this treasure map of your environment, right? <laughs> you have a list of all the assets and, and the software that's running and the services and the versions of the software and the services, which they can map to vulnerabilities. And then they could use that to come and, and attack the environment and, and take control, which obviously is the last thing that we want to have happen in OT. That's why we're here. So we already started to touch on right this idea that you know we need asset registers in OT environments, just like we have to have asset inventories in, in IT. I think also like in asset inventories in IT, they're never they're never going to be perfect. And even if they are a hundred percent accurate, let's say today, something's probably going to change tomorrow or next week or within the next year. And it's not going to be 100% accurate. So I never assume any of these are 100% accurate. I've never met an IT environment that, unless it was super tiny and super small, that had an asset inventory that was 100% accurate. It just doesn't happen. I did a, I did a presentation at a Gartner conference one time in front of, you know, I think 300 CIOs and, and CSOs. And asked, you know, raise your hand if, if you feel that your inventory management program has everything 100% or as close to 100% as possible. And one guy raised his hand and he was sitting in the front row. So, of course, everybody else sitting in the room was laughing at him behind his back because it just, it just doesn't work that way. They're never going to be perfect, but we need them to be as close to perfect as possible. And why I focus on them, it's not necessarily a matter of, do I care? What do we have in the environment? Sure, we say, you know, we have to know or understand what we have in the environment to be able to protect it. And I'm like, yeah, there's a sense of truth to that. But I don't completely agree with that. I can still protect the environment, even if I don't know everything that's in it. Because if I then play off of the two main areas that I always focus on in cybersecurity, whether it's in IT or OT, when we talk about vulnerability management and we talk about incident detection and response, I cannot effectively do vulnerability management or incident detection and response in an OT environment without an asset register. So without that asset register, we're only guessing. And so if I can't become aware of the vulnerabilities in the environment? Or what if I have an incident? How do I respond? How do I even know I have an incident in the first place? And we'll talk about a couple of stories that, uh, as we go throughout uh, of things that, that either I've seen or I've talked with people, uh, especially recently, that have, have had certain circumstances come up where you know they didn't have an asset register and here's how it did to damage, or here's where the lack of an asset register prevented them from effectively responding in an incident that did significant damage to the environment to the point where people lost jobs. And that's one of the, the big focuses for me in, in cybersecurity always is I don't want a breach ever to result in somebody losing their job. Right? It's just as easy as that. So I know I'm going off on a tangent already. <laughs> 
But the idea is that with the asset register, it's our inventory list. Now, very similar to IT, but there are other pieces of information about those assets that we're going to be tracking in OT that we don't see in, in IT. And as hopefully by now throughout the course, we understand you know, IT and OT environments, while very similar, they're also very different. So your asset register, yeah, it's going to look very similar to an IT asset inventory, but it's also going to be different. So we want to make sure we include, when we talk about all the assets in the OT environment, we're talking about all the hardware. So whether it's a server, a workstation, an HMI, a PLC, DCS, all of your sensors and other instrumentation we have at that lowest level of the Purdue model, right? That's, we want to make sure all of those are listed. And then all the software that's running on those systems. And then also the firmware. Firmware is not necessarily something that's always tracked in the IT world. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But it's something we definitely want to be tracking in the OT world. So we're going to be tracking all hardware, software, and firmware. And those are the three main focuses. But then we'll also have lots of other properties for these that we're tracking that we'll see when we look at some of the examples of or sample asset registers. You know, if you have virtualized assets, let's say I'm running a VMware server, and then I have a bunch of virtualized hosts running on top of that. We want to make sure all of those virtualized hosts are inventoried as well as the VMware server. Because those are all assets. They're all, you know, and I always think of, especially, and this isn't always 100% true, but for the most part, if you think hey, if something has an IP address in it, on it, I want to know about it in particular. Now, I understand in OT environments, maybe not all assets are running TCP IP. Maybe they're just talking in an older OT protocol. They don't have to talk TCP IP, right? Maybe old Profinet, right? That host, oh, it doesn't have, a, have an IP address, but we'll still see it talking on the network. We'll actually see that in the example that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But again, my main focus and why I want to work in asset registers and why it's so important is that it builds into allowing us to do vulnerability management and incident detection response. Without that asset register, we're, we're crippled, right? We're hampered and we can't do the job 100%. Probably can't even do it 50%. And like I mentioned earlier, is that we never want to assume that the asset register is 100% complete. I'm very fortunate that most of the environments that I work in you know, through my day job, they're brand new environments. Right? I have a client that I'm working with you know, outside of my, my day job now, which is a, a brand new manufacturing facility. And maybe that asset inventory is a hundred percent accurate today, but again, changes are ha happening over time, and it's never going to be a hundred percent accurate. Let alone, what if you had an attacker come in to the environment and maybe they take something out, or you know, probably more important, they leave something, right? They connect maybe some type of attack jump host to the network. So things to start to consider. So we, it's kind of a weird situation where I can talk about, well, we have to have asset registers and we want them as accurate as, as they can be, right? We want them to be 100% complete, but also with the understanding that it might not be that way tomorrow because something can always change. And so when we talk about different changes, that can happen. Yeah, common occurrences is what if a, a technician comes in to you know, connect a, a, a new sensor to, to the network and doesn't let anybody know? Right? Will we even detect that? Maybe not. But now we have a new asset on the network that we don't understand. And maybe that asset has a vulnerability that we need to be able to understand. You know, what if a PLC programmer uh, brings in a new engineering workstation, right? Maybe they bring in their personal laptop and plug it into the OT network to do programming on, on a PLC. Would we detect that? And what are the dangers there, 
right? If somebody brings in a personal laptop and plugs it in, well, what if they were infected while they're at home? I was just talking with a gentleman actually this morning from the UK. He worked in, in a manufacturing facility where there was a lady that brought in a USB drive from home because she wanted to show off some holiday pictures, you know, plugs it into the, the OT network. And because that personal USB drive she had was infected and infected all the systems at the manufacturing plant and the manufacturing plant not only went down, but because they had no backups, they had no ability to recover that the plant shut down. They went out of business and 160 people lost their jobs just because somebody wanted to bring in their holiday photos and show them off on the OT network. That's pretty devastating. I can imagine the responsibility that, that that woman felt. I mean, hopefully she felt responsible for it. So what happens when we bring in these different types of, of assets? We actually had a client one time where some one of the operators in the control room, they, they thought it was a good idea to bring in an Xbox. Now, I don't know why they thought they were going to have an internet connection for the Xbox in the control room because that's always a big no-no in OT environments. But for some reason, right, they, they thought they would bring in their Xbox and connect it to the network and, and play games. And they're at, the, at work in the middle of the night, right? That's something we want to be able to detect. When somebody attaches a new device to the network, we want to get an alert and be able to investigate. 99.9% of the times, it's not something evil. It's not something malicious. It's somebody doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, right? They're bringing in the personal USB drive. They're bringing in their Xbox because apparently they're bored, the you know the maintenance technician you know, doing the the install of the 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 field device right they just forgot to let somebody know they didn't maybe go through the appropriate change management procedures there's lots of reasons but again 99.9 percent .9 of what we find in ot environments when looking for the bad things we don't find the evil malicious cyber attackers it's it's you know, people just making stupid mistakes. There are times we can find operational issues. That if we find those issues, we can get them fixed before they can affect the availability or the uptime of the plan, which is great. So that's where we really push when we talk about implementing things like network security monitoring in OT environments. It's not just about security. It can also help with things like ensuring availability, but by identifying operational issues. We have another one, and this is you know, the classic example. And I see this a lot of facilities where you go, especially larger facilities out in the middle of nowhere, and they don't take physical security as seriously as they should. And somebody could just walk into the, the facility and they, they could plant a device on the network and it gets an IP address from DHCP and boop, they're off and running because they have that foothold on the network. So they're able to attack other devices in the environment or, or what if they're doing this over Wi-Fi? Right after I'm recording this, I actually have a, a meeting with one of our engineers for a large project in, in Canada about securing wireless communication in OT environments. So it's extremely important, but it's one of those areas that, that are, are vastly overlooked. So when you look at, and this is what kind of alluded to earlier, right? Where do we put the asset registry? And, or how do we create it? I mentioned most asset registers still today are, are in Excel. Now there are uh, different applications you can buy. So we talk about off-the-shelf solutions you can you can purchase. I, I've seen environments uh, build you know, internal web applications to be able to store so as something like a Microsoft SQL Server backend, and they create a web interface. And so there's not really a lot to do. You could probably code one of these with ChatGPT in probably 15 minutes or less, All right? So it's 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 not hard hard to do. It's actually probably a good idea, <laughs> but. But we still see most of these are, are stored in Excel. 
again, we'll come back and talk about it as we wrap up. The main idea is I don't care where it is other than it needs to be accessible, but it also needs to be secure. So we want to make sure plant personnel have access to that information when we're doing things like vulnerability management, having conversations around risk. We're doing network security monitoring, but can we want to make sure that the attackers aren't able to access that information because it gives them that, that treasure map on how to break into the environment. And that's not what we want to provide. We also mentioned in that last point, Sure, you can go out and buy an application and you can store this in the cloud, right? some app that's running on the internet. Just keep in mind that any cloud environment, any app that's out there on the internet, it's going to be compromised one day. Okay, it's another one. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but maybe next month, maybe next year. It's going to be compromised. So do you want to take that risk? Or do you want to make sure that it's only stored locally on premise where your employees can access it, right? It's a, it's a risk conversation definitely to be had. And it may, might sound silly, but it's actually one of those really important conversations to have about where are we going to store the asset register, right? We want to make sure everybody has access to it. At least the people that need access to it Right, our plan operators, our, our OT cybersecurity team members. They need access to the asset register. So do we want to put, put it in a cloud-based application that's eventually going to get hacked and then the attackers have access to that information? And at that point, again, they have that treasure map on just basically a guideline on, yeah, here's exactly how you break into the environment and take control over it. Again, that's not something that we want to have exposed. So now that we've talked a little bit of the idea of what an asset register is and where we're going to put this inventory data, right? Whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a web application, maybe in the cloud, maybe, maybe not. But what are we storing in the asset register? And there's a lot of information that we could put in the register. I'm always a fan of the more, the better. And realistically, once you put it in there once, you have that information and you don't have to ideally worry about you know, losing it or, or having to go back and recreate it for somewhere. Or maybe you forget a piece of information that you later need and then you scramble around trying to find it. So I'm a big fan of having as much up front as possible, throw everything in the kitchen sink into it personally. But keep it organized, right? And that's Excel's good at that. But and you can see, so there's there's an asset ID that's asso uh, assigned to that asset or that system. Usually, that's an internal naming convention, right? That mm -hmm. that will assign even if it's you're the first asset, right? You're the second asset we've deployed. You're the third asset, and and so on. It just doesn't have to be anything complicated. Usually we'll have asset names, you know, we'll give systems names or use a naming convention that help us remember or understand what that asset is just based off of its name, maybe even where it's located on site. So we can use that, the, the naming convention to help us with that. We'll talk about the asset type. So is it a workstation, a server, a PLC, a, an HMI, et cetera, et cetera. Right, the location, where is it stored? Right? What building is it um, or out in the field or in a substation or the, the list goes on and on, right? Where is this, this asset hiding, right? Where, where do we have it located? So we want to make sure that that's, that's definitely a piece of information we have listed. Right? We want to understand who the manufacturing, the manufacturer is, right? Who's the vendor, right? Who produced it? Because we also want to know the model because we can use that information to understand if I have, let's say a Siemens PLC, that's a SL1200, right, there could be certain vulnerabilities that are associated with that, let alone there could be different attacks that are specific to the SL1200 that I need to be aware of from a security perspective. And I need to understand that I have these PLCs in the environment. So I have these risks, I have these vulnerabilities. You see, we can track serial numbers for assets, so it's always it comes in handy for for inventory purposes, or if you're maybe calling in for support. 
uh, if there's an IP address, right? So if it's running TCP IP, then you want to have the IP address. If if it's running TCP IP, it's going to have a MAC address. It could also have a MAC address if it's if it's running some other protocol and not TCP IP. So you're going to want to to have those listed there. That's especially one of those keys that's going to help us later on doing network security monitoring and incident detection. I think it's when it was installed. All right, that's yeah, maybe good background information to to have. Now I want to see well, what firmware is installed, what software is running on it, and and what version of software because those are other pieces of information that we can use to find out are there vulnerabilities in that firmware, are there vulnerabilities in that software that we need to be aware of. Now, again, if we have that asset register we can plug that into our vulnerability management processes to look up to see if those vulnerabilities exist. And if there is a vulnerability, well, how bad is it? And we're going to come back and talk about that more in the next part. But it's really that understanding of if we have a critical risk vulnerability, does it threaten safety, right? Rather physical or environmental safety, or does it threaten the operations of the plan? If it is, then we're going to want to look at how we're going to get that addressed. If it doesn't threaten one of those three things, honestly, we're probably not going to do anything about it because it's not going to threaten right, our main focuses, right? keeping people safe, keeping the environment safe, keeping the plant up and running, producing whatever it produces. You see, we track the last maintenance date. Sometimes that can come in handy, uh, whether from a security perspective or, or an operations perspective. Right, some when's the last time somebody fiddled with something? Right, maybe we're seeing some strange activity coming, maybe from this HMI talking to a PLC. We hadn't seen these commands before, and we saw these starting with oh, this last maintenance date. So maybe it was just because of a firmware update or some programming change. It wasn't an attacker taking over the HMI and using it to try to compromise the the PLC like to know when there's a maintenance schedule, if there's a regular maintenance schedule for this type of equipment. So that way, when we do get alerts, we can see, is this in a maintenance schedule or not? Because I can give it a sign idea. If I see LPLC maybe go from run mode, which means it's up and running and ideally in read-only mode, so it can't be changed, more on that later, you know, versus is it in program mode? which does put it in this kind of writable format where people can do things or a technician can upload firmware or make changes to PLC programming. You see, are we going to consider it a mission critical asset? If I lost this asset, if this asset went down and I didn't replace it, let's say for days, would the entire operation come to a standstill or would we still be up and running? If the entire operation would come to a standstill, or if it's used to ensure safety, like our SIS, remember the safety instrumented system, the, the fail-safe backup that we've talked about, that is considered a mission-critical asset. If we have no SIS, the plant's not running, because then we have no way to guarantee people are safe. We see a responsible party. We want to make sure, well, who, who are we going to contact if... We have a question about one of these devices. What if I get a security alert about a specific IP address? I can look it up in the asset register, understand, oh, well, what type of asset this is, right? Oh, it's it's a PLC. Oh, okay, well, who's the vendor? Oh, it's, it's Alan Bradley slash Rockwell. It's a micro 820 PLC. Well, who, who do I need to contact about questions on that? Right? Maybe it's an engineer or someone in operations. Right? Who do I need to reach out to? Let's see, a status, a lot of times, is it in production? Maybe not. You can look at uh, if there's any additional notes that people have placed. And then when we get more into ISA 62443, but we, we started to introduce, and in the last section, when we started talking about secure network architecture, the idea of zones and conduits. So every asset should be assigned to reside in a zone. Or it can be a VLAN, but remember, it's this idea of a, a sub-network where all the assets are collected together because they share a common purpose. So all of the assets that make up the SIS, right? They're in a SIS zone. 
And then if you have any communication into or out of that zone, remember each path, each form of communication, each, you know, one essentially ACL, right? The access control list. If we have a path from one IP address to another IP address, that would be a conduit. And then we're also remembering to make them as specific as possible. So not just IP address to IP address, but we also have to make sure to include the source and the destination ports, right? So it's a lot of information. And there's there's other pieces of information that you could put into an asset register, but I think that's a lot of the, the common ones. It's rare actually to see zones and conduits for most people, but it's you know now in 2024, we're starting to see people understanding the importance of 62443, seeing it as the gold standard of how do I build a cybersecurity program for my OT network. And so we do see zones and conduits pop up. If you don't have them there initially, you're going to want to add them later on because you are going to do risk assessments. And we're going to talk about that in one of the later parts. But when you do those risk assessments, it's all based off of, guess what, zones and conduits. And really it's about what assets do we have, what zones are they in, and what zones are talking with what other zones. That's the risk assessment. So we have to have that information to be able to do a risk assessment. That's why another reason why this section is very important. Here's a sample idea. Honestly, I just had this generated in ChatGPT. I don't often use ChatGPT. I don't use it to um, write text or context, but uh, when it was, oh, you know what? Create a sample asset register. It's a it's a perfect job for it. So I don't have to sit there and, and take the time to worry about it. And so you can see yeah, asset ID, asset name, asset type, the manufacturer. So that's why you get all these, you know, kind of generic names, right? A model, serial number, location, IP address, installation date, last, last maintenance date, and then status. You know what? I think it did a really good job personally. I mean, we could have gone back and used like real manufacturer names like Siemens and um, Rockwell and, and used real models of, of assets. But but other than that, I again, I, I'm happy with this. <laughs> I thought it was a good, good, uh, they did a good job. So now that we've looked at this idea of, yeah, here's a sample asset register and here's all this information that we can store in the database that well now again what if we go into an environment and they don't have an asset register or they say they have an asset register but it's sadly lacking they might have 10 assets listed and they could have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of assets you know depending on the size of the environment so there's really four main ways that we can build that asset register or continue to update it. And so we're, we're going to come back and, and look at each one of these in, in detail. You can see the number one way we can look at or the number one that we, the first one we talk about, probably not the, the, one, the one's preferred, but we can lock the environment. We can trace cables. We can go into the, the, the data room and, and look at the first switch we see and grab the first cable we see and lock it down. Right, trace it down. Yeah, start to think though that that takes time, that takes takes money, and as our employees trace cables out into an environment, they're probably not in a very safe environment. Right, so there's this idea of putting our employees in harm way, harm's way. So walking the environment is not necessarily always prefer. I think I've already shared the, the story of when I was in the grid course, one of the gentlemen that was taking the class, his job was to do this at Disney World for all the rides. <laughs> and that's a really cool job. So they would shut down each of the rides for like two weeks and he would trace cables to figure out how each of the rides was, was wired. And then he would also look at the protocols that they are used because you know, you had a different person writing these different protocols for each of the different rides, and they were very custom jobs. And of course, they weren't actually, you know, any type of industry standard, as you might imagine. So, 
Now there's review, we can review existing data. So this is where, yeah, we can find network diagrams, programming data, project files, procurement info, right, invoices where we've purchased this equipment. So we can use all of that to try and understand what's in the environment. We can capture network traffic and then we can examine that. So we can use a tool like Wireshark to, to capture traffic on the wire and use that to see, well, what assets are talking with each other? Because we can use that to identify things like IP addresses or MAC addresses, protocols being used. Because again, not everything necessarily in an OT environment is talking TCP IP. We're going to see some examples of that today. And then we can also talk about, we can actively scan the environment using a tool like Nmap. And, and we'll do some of that in the, the home lab. But when you think about it, right, we always talk about we don't want to do active scanning in a production environment because there's always a chance it'll cause an issue. Now, it's more true in older environments, but do you want to take the chance that you cause some type of issue, especially whether it's, again, you're going to crash the site and bring it down for three days and cost the company $10 million, or what if it could introduce some type of physical or environmental safety issue. I had a CSO, a CISO for a very large manufacturing company in the United States told me one time that they had a basically a, a PLC that if you scanned it with Nmap and it went down, it the resulting chain reaction would create an explosion that would leave a crater in the ground a mile wide. And he was completely serious, 100%. So that's always, always stuck with, you know, always stuck with me. So we want to be very careful. Now, is that an extreme case? Most definitely. But it's always in the back of my mind. Do you want to ever take a chance for me? No, there can, there can never be enough liability insurance or errors and in, in emissions insurance to offset the, the dangers that we have in OT environments. So let's go back and talk about, you know, when we walk in the environment, and we've already covered most of this, so we're not going to spend a ton of time here. Remember, the idea is we're out there, we're taking the time to physically trace cables. But if we're physically in the site, there could be danger depending on, on the site. And most OT environments, right, there's always some level of danger, just very different levels. Right? But even in a maybe a tiny manufacturing facility, you're still probably wearing steel-toed boots and, and a hard hat and a safety vest and safety glasses. There's a reason why you're wearing the PPE. Right? to protect yourself in case something goes wrong. You see, this is going to take the most time. Right? I always think of, this is the one that, that I had added you know, after the fact, but I was thinking of, because I've, <laughs> I've done this before, and whether my home OT lab or in, in IT, what if I'm tracing cables and uh, I'm moving my hand to the cable behind, you know, maybe it's going into a rack and there's other cables and accidentally, you know, one of the other cables comes loose and I don't realize it. What type of issue did I just create? Maybe it's something that's no big deal. Maybe it's something that brings down the environment. We don't, we don't know. One of the things we do add in there though, is if you're out there in the field, right? If you're out in the plant, one of the things we talk about is you want to, if you have PLCs and they have key switches, whether it's like literally a physical key or sometimes it's like a dip switch, right? A little switch you can just flip up and down. The idea is we want to make sure all of those are always kept in run mode. Because the general idea is if you have the key switch in run mode, it puts the PLC in read-only mode. So that way it can't be changed, at least remotely, by an attacker. So they can't upload malicious firmware or PLC programming uh, like they did in the Trisis incident. Remember, the Russians had come into the petrochemical facility run by Saudi Aramco. And because the SIS wasn't on a separate segment and that it was connected and the key switch was 
in program mode. It allowed the attackers to remotely access the, the SIS controllers and upload essentially malicious code. So we always want to make sure that if controllers have those key switches, whether it's a physical key or a little dip switch, then you want to make sure it's in run mode. Now, a lot of people say, well, that keeps it safe. That's not necessarily true. And again, this goes back to my thesis, but the idea is that not all PLCs play by the same rules. So it's really up to the vendor. Some vendors say, yeah, if you're run mode, you can't make remote changes. Now, all the PLCs that I tested, they allow you, even when you're in run mode, to still make changes to the PLC code. Now, you can't upload new firmware, so it helps some of the problem, but not all of the problem. And then the other part with this is if people are just monitoring for the key switch, the problem is a lot of PLCs, especially lower end ones, right, lower cost ones that you'll see in more you know, smaller to medium sized environments, they don't have key switches. Some of them might have a dip switch, but a lot of it, even the Siemens SL1200 uh, that I paid $1,500 for that it has no hardware switch. You can control it through software, but there is no hardware switch. So I, I can't just look for a PLC key switch and make sure it's in run mode because it doesn't exist. So there's other aspects that we want to monitor for. Like I want to monitor when it comes out of run, run mode because somebody could have used software to take it out of run mode to make programming changes or upload firmware. But just a couple things. I don't want to go too far off the, the tangent. So we can review project file data. Again, this is it really is just idea of how all the information we have related to the environment, right? So network diagrams is a is a big one, of course. Logical, physical, and then we'll have things like oh PLCs and IP addresses and HMI is listed and there are IP addresses and maybe it has the vendor information and and so on. Other system design specifications, so you can have a lot of uh, you know, other documents that go along with network diagrams. They could have some details. Uh, the programming files themselves for PLCs could have potential information in there. Right? Asset specifications, so as you're designing the environment, those specifications can give us clues or have information about like what types of PLCs that we have in the environment. And you can see, I mean, a lot of the different records to, you know, and, and plans that are associated with the project can all have clues to what types of assets we have in the environment, especially when we talk about, again, those purchase records, which is something that I don't think a lot of people, people talk about. But I was at work one day realizing as we were going through talking about a practice to ensure when our engineers are ordering equipment, right, we have a whole security questionnaire that goes with it. And then, of course, these assets eventually, when they're brought on site, are placed into the, the asset register. So we should be able to go back through those purchase records and find assets. There's also another way that we're going to look at in a minute where we talk about we can go into the network. And there's different places where we can look for clues, like on network switches and firewalls, where we can look at ARP tables. So those ARB tables will show us the IP addresses and the MAC addresses of any systems that are sending traffic through that device. Again, typically a firewall or a, a network switch. And again, we're going to come back and, and talk about that in a few minutes. So here's an example of a network diagram. This is one I just got off of the Cisco kind of OT ICS site that they have. And so we can see here's maybe some some switches, right? We can see a model number. I don't see any IP address for it. So I, I'm assuming it has a management interface that's probably out of band, so it's not connected to the rest of the network. But there's probably still an IP address there to manage it, unless they're making you physically watch the walk to the switch to make those changes. But then I can see, oh, here's some type of asset at 182.168.200.400. Here's one at 10.195.119.9, right? Here's, oh, here's an HMI at 10.195.119.8. 
So we do have a list of here are some assets. I think of it as as building a Sudoku puzzle or Sudoku puzzle, however you say it. Or his idea is you get these little pieces of information. Like I said, oh, I have this asset, maybe this switch at IE, named IE4000 119.25 over here. Oh, and I know it's in zone one. Okay, great. That's some great information. But I don't have an IP address for its management interface or a MAC address. Or I could probably look up the vendor, right? Or in this case, okay, we know it's Cisco. But what firmware is running on this box? Right? Are there any other potential applications or software running on the box? Probably not, because it's a switch. But there's all pieces of information that we need to gather. So we just have this one little clue that it's, oh, okay, you have a switch that's named this. Now go find all this other information. Right? Same thing like when we're over here. Right? And there's other pieces because I can say, oh, well, all of these hosts start with 10.195.119. So they're on this subnet. 10.195.119. Maybe there's other host in that same subnet and they're just not on the, the network diagram. Right? So it's just finding all these little clues and then having to chase them to ground. Now this is kind of jumping a little bit ahead or to the side, but this is what the home lab network looks like that we're going to be using to do the scanning and the, the passive sniffing. So this is what I had set up for the doing the, the thesis that I was working on. So you can see I have my, my laptop, the engineering workstation at 192.168.100.100. And then it's connected with a really long Ethernet cable to the other side of my living room <laughs> through a unmanaged network switch that I paid $20 for off of Amazon. So nothing special. And then actually I have four PLCs connected to it, but we're only seeing three here. But that's part of the, ooh, well, how are we going to find that fourth one? So you can see I have a Click Plus PLC that's at .200. I have an Allen Bradley or Rockwell automation, a Micro A20 at .220. And then there's the Siemens SL1200 at 220 that I was talking about. And then again, there's there's one other mystery machine. This is what I have out there for the, the thesis. So I don't have any other systems that are actually being controlled. And there's there's no HMI. The HMI hasn't shown up yet. I'm very disappointed with that. Um, but so that's what we're going to work with. So okay, we'll come back and look at that. But this is what we're going to be scanning. And this is what we're going to mm -hmm. be looking at network traffic for when we come back and, and get into those sections. So earlier we were talking about one place to find information about hosts on the network is in network switches. Now I should have said these are managed network switches. So remember this network switch I have in the home lab, it's unmanaged. So it's not going to give us an interface. It's not going to show us any information. So it's, it's worthless other than it provides connectivity, which, you know, that's all I cared about, honestly. But if I have, let's say, Cisco network switches in the environment, which is still very popular in, in OT, I can log into the switch with an administrative name and, and password, and I can look at the config. Sometimes the configs have pieces of information. Like in this case, you can see, well, the switch probably has a IP address of 192.168.1.1. So maybe that's what they're using as a default gateway. So they're using it as a router, which you can do with a what they call a level three switch. Right, I can see some descriptions on ports like PLC-1, firewall-1, valve-1. So, oh, okay, well, I have a PLC and maybe it's named PLC-1. Well, what's the IP address on the interface named Fast Ethernet 01? Right now there's a new PLC I can add to the asset register. Again, it's playing Sudoku. And when you're on that managed switch, you can also tell it to show you the ARP table. So the ARP table tracks all of the IP addresses and the MAC addresses, or the MAC addresses, that physical 48-bit address that we assign to the network interface card when we connect it or that we connect to the network. And so we have that physical address, the MAC address on each network interface, and then we logically assign it an IP address. 
So we always talk about, well, we talk IP address to IP address. Well, really, we talk MAC address to MAC address. The IP address, and that's that logical address that makes it easier for, for us to be able to connect to computers at that transport layer of the OSI model. But with ARP, right, we can go to these network devices. And we can also do this on, on our machines, which we're going to take a look at in a second. But any machine that either passes TCP IP traffic or that talks TCP IP, it's going to have a command to be able to look at the ARP cache to see. Oh, yeah, in this case, right, I can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different hosts with IP addresses. I can see how long that's been in the cache, right? When's the last time that communication was seen? Now, in this case, I don't see who's talking with who. I just see there is a host at 192.168.80.1. And that it has a MAC address of 000BBEE26F00. And then can also see it's on VLAN 80, which is also another great piece of information we can use. But again, I'm really interested in those IP addresses and the MAC addresses. So that's with being able to look at the, the ARP cache. So real quickly, just going like, okay, well, we're talking about ARP and ARP caches. So what the heck is ARP? So in ARP we use in the world of TCP IP to allow computers initially to find each other. And it's also very important when we do things like, let's well, tied in with the DHCP process, right? If you, you have a host like a, let's say an engineering workstation, maybe that doesn't have a static IP address for some reason. If you had a DHCP server, you could use it to assign a dynamic IP address to that, that workstation. Now that's usually just in IT. You should have static IP addresses for everything in OT, there's no reason not to, right? Don't don't be lazy. So, but the idea is that ARP allows us again to map those logical IP addresses to the physical addresses, the MAC address, on each of our network interfaces. Or it's a 48 bits long, which usually represented in hex, and then it's broadcast traffic, which means it goes to all of the computers on that local network. So everybody's going to see it, and we'll, and we'll see some examples in, in a second. So that traffic goes everywhere on the network. So if there's a computer there, if there's an asset there, and it talks TCP IP, or it's able to at least see ARP traffic and understand it, it will see the traffic and then try to, to process it. Now, you see that last note is broadcast traffic, including ARP, Right, that's actually blocked by routers because you don't want to have like this broadcast traffic sent everywhere and then it gets out to the internet and then it tries to go everywhere on the internet and everybody else is doing the same thing. Oh, your bandwidth would fill up and everything would crash. So we do broadcast in a very limited fashion. We even use broadcast to do discovery of assets like those PLCs I had in my doing the home research. Right. When I had like the Click PLC, when I installed the Click PLC software on the engineering workstation, the first thing it does is it sends out a broadcast out on the network to say, hey, are there any Click PLCs out there? And if there's any Click PLCs out there on the network, they respond back and say, yeah, hey, I'm here. Here's my IP address. Here's my MAC address. Here's my firmware version hey, I'm in run mode or I'm in stop mode. <laughs> it's, they give a lot of information. Here's my name. Like too much information. <laughs> but it makes it super easy, right, to set up and configure. Right? That's that whole balance between if it's easy to use, it's probably not secure and vice versa. So if we want to look at ARP traffic, and we can generate ARP traffic if we want, now we can go back and actually have Wireshark running, so just capturing traffic from the, let me uh, go back to, there it is. So here we have Wireshark. Oh my gosh, I think I had just updated it. So it's a very tiny window. So let's, yeah, blow it up so it makes it easier to read. 
And so here's all the traffic that's happening on the, the home lab. And I can see, oh yeah, there's an engineering workstation. That's the, remember, the Dell right there. It's taking that 48-bit MAC address. And it's, remember, if we take that first half, the first 24 bytes, or bits, sorry, and we do a lookup on the IEEE MAC database, we can see who the manufacturer is. So I see, oh, Dell. Oh, okay, well, that's my laptop. Or, oh, Siemens. Oh, well, I guess that's the Siemens PLC. Or Phoenix Contact. Right? Or, and then, I guess those are the ones that we see there. There's, there's a few more out there. But that's the idea. We start to see the traffic. If I want to limit it just to the ARB traffic, I can just go up into that upper field, type in ARB, and then hit Enter. Now we can see just the ARP traffic that's, that's been captured from the network. And usually, remember, with ARP, again, it's computers trying to find other computers. And so, and you can see, oh yeah, here, from this Rockwell device, it's in a, a broadcast, so it goes out to everybody on the network over ARP. And it says, hey, who out there has an IP address of 169.254.153.178? In this case, probably what happened is that PLC got turned on and the DHCP server that I was using, cheating with, uh, was turned off. And so it was saying, hey, I'm going to give myself an IP address in this 169.254.153.178 range. If you're out there and you're using this IP address, tell me now, and I won't use it. But if it doesn't get a response back and it sounds like that IP address is free, it'll use the IP address. The idea is we just want to check because if you have two hosts using the same IP address, there's going to be conflicts. And then one will send traffic, one won't. They'll be stepping on each other and you'll have lost connectivity and you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to troubleshoot it. So that's one type of, of ARP or broadcast. You can also see the more common one is the second one we see where you can say, oh, who has 192.168.100.210? Tell 192.168.100.100. What that means is the engineering workstation at 192.168.100.100. Remember, you can see the source says Dell. It wants to talk with the PLC at .210 but it hasn't talked to it yet. So it doesn't know what the MAC address is. We Again, we know the IP address, but we don't know the MAC address. The only way to get the MAC address is to send out this broadcast and just shout out on the network. Hey, if you're out there, hey, dot 100, tell me what your MAC address is. And then if dot 100's out there, it should respond back and say, oh yeah, here's, here's my MAC address. We don't actually see it uh, right away. Oh, actually, it probably responded back, not with a broadcast, but unit cast or point to point, which is why you probably don't see it. But that's some of the ARP traffic. If I go ahead and let's go ahead and oh, let me hide my little recording bar. <laughs> let's go ahead and stop this. We're going to go ahead and let's do a brand new capture. Because right, what we're talking about back on the slides is we can use Nmap as a tool to generate a ARP broadcast on the local subnet to hopefully find hosts that are out there. And you'll see how effective or let's say ineffective it could be, right? It's more effective in, in certain environments. I'm surprised it's less effective, but let's, let's go ahead and open up Nmap. All right, so if I use Nmap, and we're going to go ahead and test against our 100.0 slash 24. That's the, the subnet mask, so or subnet range and subnet mask for the, the home research lab. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a dash S, lowercase s, lowercase n. That basically says, do a ARP broadcast. So if I go back... To Wireshark, you can see that's exactly what what Nmap is doing. You can see it's just saying, hey, 
one, are you out there, right? We can go all the way to the beginning, right? Are you out there, right? Or I guess kind of out of order, but <laughs> one, are you out there? Dot two, are you out there? Dot 85, are you out there? Dot 86, are you out there? Dot 87, are you out there? It's going through all 254 possible combinations to say, hey, if you're out there, if you are, tell me and I'll add you to my list. So here we actually see a response. Somebody responded back and said, oh yeah, hey, I'm 192.168.100.200 and I'm at 00D07C1A5687. So well, now we know there's something at 192.168.100.200 and it has a MAC address of 00D07C1A5687 and or we took that 00D07C, the first half of the MAC address, and we looked it up, or Wireshark did in this case, in the IEEE database, and it says, oh, that was was manufactured by the Ject Electronics. Well, I know that's going to be the Click PLC. Again, this is how we can look at network traffic to get an idea of, oh, yeah, there's two hosts, right? There's one at 192.168.100.200 and 192.168.100.100. And if we keep going down, then, oh, hey, we found, oh, here's somewhere, for, here's somebody who's a Rockwell device. And it's responding saying, hey, I'm at 210 and my MAC address is BCF4990013092. And if you take that BCF499 and you look it up in the IEEE MAC database, you see Rockwell Automation. Like, oh, okay, well, there's the Rockwell 820, the Micro 820 PLC I have sitting over there. So again, it's building the Sudoku puzzle. Now, some OT environments will tell you not even to generate ARP traffic. That is too dangerous. So that's a whole conversation you have to have. And, and any type of scanning or any type of network traffic you create, you're going to need authorization to do that in the environment. Most people will tell you that, you know, ARP traffic is very limited. It's not, I guess, heavy to, to, to hit systems if it's just like one packet hitting at all of them, you know, one time. So I think a lot of environments will say, yeah, there's a place. But that's the idea of an ARP broadcast where it just asks, hey, if you're out there on the network, tell me. And you could see that there were some responses saying, hey, I'm here. Here's my MAC address. So we have that ability. And then Nmap comes back and puts it, oh, in the screen for you. And says, oh, yeah, well, we found someone at 100.100. Well, yeah, that's the workstation we're running the, the scan from. So thanks for that. <laughs> and then we can see, oh, there's, there's something at 251, but we don't know what that is yet. It's actually another IP address on the same laptop, so don't get too excited there. Now we can also see that, oh, there's one, something at 100.200, and it's we don't know exactly what it is, but here's its MAC address, and here's the vendor, Koyo Electronics. That's the, the Click PLC. And then here we have, oh, there's a host at 192.168.100.210, and well, that is an unknown MAC address, which is, we see Nmap doesn't know what these are because it hasn't updated its IEEE MAC database, but Wireshark does. So Wireshark's own local database is more up to date than this version of, of Nmap. And this should actually be a fairly new version of Nmap. So that's why Nmap and Wireshark look differently. They're just using different versions of that database. Now, also remember, there's two other PLCs out there, but we're not seeing them here. And so as we get further on through this part, we'll see, well, why is that? Why aren't we seeing that? Well, are they talking TCP IP? Or maybe they are talking TCP, but maybe are they hidden in some way, shape, or form? Right? Something something to consider, but not to, to give everything away. Sometimes, and this is a screenshot I took from another Wireshark capture, and in general uh, broadcast traffic, what you see is the destination is 
all Fs, which represents a subnet mask and destination of 255.255.255.255, which logically means we go to every machine on the network. Right? This was just a different type of capture. This was not uh, Nmap traffic. Right? Um, and here's a screenshot of this was on my home IT network. Right? So I can see my default gateway at 10.2.1.1. And that's made by a company, and their the company name is actually called routerboard.com. Or you can see my Amazon Alexa at 10.2.1.244. Or, oh, again, there's some unknown device, but we know it's at 10.2.1.247. I see there's, oh, some type of Intel device that's almost always like a PC or a laptop. I see that at 10.2.1.254. And then, oh, there's a Roku TV at .254. Here, right, here, right down here. And then there's also something at 252, but we're not sure what that is. So you get lots of information, right? And that's a great tool to use. I love MMAP. MMAP's still my favorite tool, and it's 25 years old. And I've been using it pretty much since day one when it came out. So we'll talk a lot more about that as we go on. But that's just a real quick, brief introduction. So we also mentioned you can go into other different types of systems to look up the, the ARP table. So I can go and I can, if I open up the command prompt on my Windows machine and I type in ARP-A, you can actually see, and this is for every, interf I have every interface on the machine, I have a ton of interfaces because VMware is installed and a few other things are emulation software is installed. But you can see for this one interface, it knows, oh, here's a bunch of IP addresses and their MAC addresses. Now, some of these are, are not valid IP addresses for individual hosts. They're either what we call local hosts or they're broadcast addresses or they're multicasting addresses as well. So a lot of it, I know it's, and this is not that place to have that discussion, but I realize some of these are not valid hosts. Right, we're looking for things, if you want to think, like in the middle of the range. So we're not looking for dot one, we're not looking for dot 254, but I'll take, oh, there's dot 210, right? Or dot 254, that could be legit. Right? And that's, oh, um, no, and that's, that's probably about it. Those are the only legit IP addresses. So this is not the greatest example. I'm sorry, because of the way all of this does work. And that's what we're actually seeing here. So you have to limit all the things like the broadcast addresses, remember all Fs, and all those local hosts like 1.1 or 1.1. It actually could be a legitimate host. Everything else, those are all multicast addresses plus the last broadcast. So those are not you know individual hosts in which we're looking for. Now Linux, you can see, oh, here there's it, the host has a gateway and here's the MAC address. You still have to do a lookup. Well, what's the IP address for the gateway? And then here you can see, oh yeah, here's two other hosts, one at 2.2 .2 and one at 2.54, and here's the MAC addresses for those. So I'm not sure if those examples help or hurt. It depends on if you have some TCP IP experience. So it's a way to look for, again, hints on where are some IP addresses and what are those MAC addresses that are out there. But it's not as easy as, oh, here's all these IP addresses. Because again, most of these IP addresses are not actually valid host IP addresses. So we've already alluded to this idea that if we want to do active scanning or we want to map the network using a tool like Nmap, that it can be very risky slash dangerous if we want to just use Nmap or another type of scanning tool like a vulnerability scanner to just blast away on the OT network. Now, in a perfect world, we can scan everything at any time and not worry. If anything, the problems I see in a lot of OT environments is it's not that Nmap's going to necessarily blow something up or a vulnerability scanner is going to right, it's going to take out that PLC that's going to cause an explosion and put this huge crater in the ground. It's the fact that maybe the network is not wired correctly. 
And so by generating an Nmap scan, it could take down the network if the network switches aren't configured correctly. That, that could definitely happen. So we, ha we still have to be careful. A couple things to remember. Yes, we're going to be careful. If we're doing any type of network scanning, we have to have authorization first. Keep in mind, and like we'll see in the lab, right? not all those PLCs are running TCP IP. So when we do a, a look, you know, a, an ARP scan to look for hosts running TCP IP and get their MAC addresses, remember we only saw two assets respond. But we know there's two other PLCs there. Like, hmm, okay, well, what are they running? And we'll talk more about this as we go on when we get into the threat and vulnerability management part, which is next, right? Or say that says unified, but it's part six. So the next next uh, video. But again, with active scanning, we're only going to do this with authorization. Right? And the whole point with active scanning is we're generating packets to put on the network. Why people in OT environments get scared when you do this, especially the, the old school folks, is that older OT equipment, they're not designed to understand different types of network packets. They're only designed to understand the specific network packets that are legitimately being sent to it. They don't have you know, basically error checking information or error code or collection built in. So if I get, am I an older PLC and I get this packet that's saying, hey, what's your MAC address? But I don't understand what ARP traffic is. I get so confused that it takes up all my resources and I crash. That's why active scanning still has a bad name in OT environments. And it can still cause issues, right? And so we always want to make sure are people are going to be safe. Is the environment safe? Is the plant going to stay up and running? Can you guarantee those things 100%? If you can't, don't think about running Nmap. So there's a, a give and take. There's there's a balance, especially in newer environments, right? There's there's an approach that, that we'll talk about where we can find that, that good balance where we can scan and, and where we can't, or where maybe we can. Again, it just is going to depend from environment to environment. And we mentioned the common uh, NMAP sc or scanning tool, network scanning tool we use is NMAP, whether it's an IT or, or OT. Because it, it's been around for 25 years and, and it's still the one tool everybody uses. It's like Wireshark because it works and it does an awesome job. Why do anything else? Any other tools you see, network scanning tools uh, that are quote unquote better than Nmap, it's only because they're faster and they can be super fast. And those could definitely crash an OT network because they can definitely crash an IT network that's wired correctly. So they could easily crash an, either an OT network that's wired correctly or an o OT network that is not wired correctly at all. If you want to see some of the horror stories, you can follow uh, Josh Voorhees on uh, LinkedIn. He runs a company called Traceroute. And that's his whole focus is doing networks in OT environments. And he has, you know, crazy stories about networks going down or, you know, assets not able to talk to each other and they get called in to, to do troubleshooting. So it's really fascinating, at least for me, you know, being an old networking person. So let's talk about Nmap a little bit. Now I have a full Nmap workshop that I'll, I'll probably post either alongside this or, or after the course. But uh, I mentioned I'm a, I'm a big fan. I've always been a big fan since day one. Yeah, I remember when Nmap pretty much came out and and it was this amazing tool where it's like, oh, I can map, I can see what hosts are on the network. And not only what hosts are on the network, but what ports are open on those hosts, you know, TCP and UDP ports. So, then you could start to guess what services are there. Uh, over time, Nmap added additional functionality like service script scans that we're going to look at to give us more information. But it's an amazing, amazing tool, right? And again, it still is. It's the reason why everybody still uses it 25 years down the road. 
It was actually created by a gentleman named he went by Fyodor, so he was Russian, reading uh, Russian Russian literature at the time. That was his thing. So, but Gordon Lyon, I uh, got to meet him at uh, DefCon one year, many many years ago, <laughs> and uh, I think NMAP 2.0 was was out at the time. But uh, you can download NMAP from insecure.org. Even though humans are insecure, computers are unsecure. But anyways, um, uh, Nmap runs on just about any operating system out there, whether it's Windows, Linux, uh, any variation of of other uh, systems that that are out there. Uh, Android, you can you can run it. I saw a study where they're talking about the software that comes with entertainment consoles and high end cars, and there was you know hundred thousand dollar Mercedes that had Nmap installed on them which which is kind of funny because uh, it used to come just installed by default on a lot of linux hosts there is a gui interface uh, in it called zen map if that's your thing uh, i think a lot of people look down at you though if you use the, the gui interface right you're supposed to use the command line uh, you can see the current version is 7.94 uh, and then i actually have some quick start guides that you can find on my github repository and you can see the URL there, and this is what they, they look like. So there's one for IT. So this is the IT version. And so it gives you some the basic commands of scanning a subnet, running things like script scans and service scans, which are incredibly powerful in, in Nmap. And then there's also the ICSOT version so it has some of the, the basic scannings, like from the, the previous Quick Start Guide. But then you can see things like in the lower middle, you can see a list of you know, some of the more common ports that we see for industrial control protocols that run over TCP IP. So when we talk about Modbus, or really, again, it's Modbus over TCP IP, we can see it runs on TCP 502 or S7, S7, S7 com, right? the Siemens Industrial Control Protocol. It runs on TCP 102 and, and so on and so forth. So, the, so those are there to help you get started with NMAP, with, whether it's in IT or in ICSOT. So we'll play around with some of this in a little bit when we talk about active scanning and, and looking at the home lab. Now with scanning a network, and this is what else touching on a little bit just a few minutes ago is using a tool like Nmap, we can go ahead and scan the network. And really what we're looking for is we're looking for what hosts are on the network, right? So we're looking for live hosts. So really I'm almost always looking for IP addresses, just like we were looking at earlier when we were looking in you know, the, the Wireshark capture or the ARP tables, right? I wanna find IP addresses and MAC addresses that indicate live hosts, right? Hosts that are on and active on the network. Then we have open ports, right? In TCP, we have 65,535 possible ports that can be active and open on one system running TCP IP. And then you also have 65,535 UDP ports as well. And we're going to come back in, in a little bit and talk about the differences between TCP and UDP. Now, once I see those ports are open, then I can do additional tests using Nmap, like service scans, to determine, well, what's running on that open port? So maybe I see TCP 22 is open, and I can assume that's for SSH, but let's not make any assumptions. Let's do some additional checks. Because maybe it's not SSH, but maybe it's being used for SFTP, like secure FTP. Which, yes, it uses SSH, but, but I think you get the idea. So we want to do additional checks to make sure what really is the service that's running on that port. Same thing if I see TCP 502 open, I can assume it's Modbus, but is it? Let me double check. And then if it is, well, then maybe I can determine, oh, then maybe it's a PLC. But we want to find live hosts. We want to enumerate or determine what open ports are on those hosts. Then we want to find out what services or applications are tied into that port. 
Then we want to find the version of that software or that application. So earlier we mentioned SSH. Well, what version, what type, what vendor of SSH? Oh, it's Open SSH version 2.22. Well, if I have that version information and the vendor information and then the, the type of software, I can use my best friend Google to see, are there any vulnerabilities associated with the software? Or maybe I determine, oh, this is a PLC. Well, what type of PLC? What version of firmware is it running? Because there's Nmap scripts that will help you find that information on PLCs. And we'll see that when we look at the do the active scanning on the, the lab. So I can take that information again back to my friend Google and say, hey, are there any vulnerabilities on this host? And if there are, then if we're an attacker or a pen tester, right, we win essentially. If we're on the defensive side, we need to determine what do we do next? Now I'm jumping ahead, right? Because that's the next part in the course where we're talking about threat and vulnerability management. So we're not going to go too far down that rabbit hole right now. But live host to open ports, to what services and applications are running on those ports, to what version of those services and applications, because we want to go to our friend Google and determine, are there any existing vulnerabilities on these hosts? And, well, if there is a vulnerability, is there an exploit that we can use to take advantage of that vulnerability and maybe gain full control over that asset? So those are our scanning objectives. Now, Nmap has a whole bunch of different scans that it can do. And this is one where I'll just, I don't have a slide on this, but I remember the first time I took Ed Scotus's SANS course. And Ed Scotus is considered kind of the godfather of pen testing. And he built all, all of the offensive security courses for, for SANS. And so Ed, and super, super great guy. I mean, like many of the SANS instructors, they're just all really phenomenal people that, that want to help. But I remember him talking about, if you really want to understand how your tools work, run Wireshark behind the scenes so that way you can go back and watch what's happening. Just like earlier, remember we were watching that ARP traffic that was being generated by an ARP scan in Nmap. So we could actually understand what's happening or what's being taken place by the actual tool itself. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to do it. But I've done that a big part of my career, especially when learning. So that way I can watch the tool, see what it's doing behind the scenes. Actually, in the first SANS ICS course that I took, they had some Nmap commands. And they said, oh, only use this Nmap command because it does not do, I'm trying to remember at this time, right, X, Y, Z. And basically I had to point out, well, if you run Wireshark and you run this command just as you have it for Nmap, it actually does. It doesn't do X, Y, Z, but it does Y and Z, which is, you definitely don't want those happening in an OT environment. So use Wireshark while you're running these tools to understand what's actually happening behind the scenes. How are they, what are they actually doing on the network? That's even more important now in OT than, than in IT. Again, IT, a lot of environments, it's just like scan away. 24, 7, 365, scan whatever you want, whenever you want. That's what it is like at my day job. I can scan 40,000 hosts anytime I want. In an OT environment, maybe with 100 hosts or 50 hosts, I'm not scanning anything, usually. We'll talk more about that as well. So one of the first types of scans that we're going to run with Nmap is a ping sweep. So this is where typically Nmap will send out an ICMP echo request, which is that first part of the, the ping packet to say, hey, are you there? And if it gets a response back, we understand that there's a host there. Right? If that host responds back with an echo reply. And that's generally how it, it, it works. There's some small exceptions. You can run Wireshark in the background if you want to learn how those different exceptions work. But Let's go ahead and open up a command prompt and we can go ahead and just do a quick scan against the 
home lab that we have set up again where we're just going to do a quote unquote ping sweep and send out an echo request now technically behind the scenes since the host recognizes that it's on the same subnet as the host that we're targeting so the engineering workstation is on the same host as the rest of the lab it realizes since they're on the same same host it can just do an art broadcast to to get a response and not have to send out icmp packets so that's actually what's going on behind the scenes uh, if you're not on the same subnet you're trying to scan then it'll actually send out icmp echo requests but anyways so here you can see that we did a quote unquote ping sweep against the home lab and we saw oh, okay there's a host at 100.200 and that looks like that's associated with Koyo Electronics there's another unknown host at two, uh, 200, 210 and then there's another one at 220 where we see Siemens so we have a Siemens industrial automation product so some Siemens thing is there at 220 we have some unknown entity at 210 and then at 200 we have Koyo Electronics right so we have a, an idea at least that there's these three hosts that are on the subnet that we can pick up from active scan now remember there's there's more because we have the engineering workstation but we're scanning from the engineering workstation so we don't see it and there's actually another PLC out there that is active on the network it's just not configured with TCP IP so once we find hosts that are out there we want to do a port scan right? this is going to allow us to find the individual ports that are open on that asset usually use the example if you're not familiar with ports the idea is especially i always think of it as from the attacker perspective is think of if somebody wants to break into a house in your neighborhood they're gonna they're gonna drive through in their probably in their car maybe they walk through the neighborhood and just casually looking for are there any open windows or maybe any doors that are popped open maybe the garage door is open and so they're looking for those openings that you can use to get into the house. Well, in this case, those ports are the doors and the windows that we can use to get into the system. Now we talk about each host running TCP IP. Each, each of those has 65,535 TCP ports. And then you have another 65,535 UDP ports as well now we're mostly focused on the tcp ports and we'll talk about that in a little bit why but it's, it takes a long time to scan all the udp ports where it doesn't take too long to scan all of the 65,535 tcp ports but that's the differences between how in tcp and udp work and we're going to come back and talk about that now we also look at ports and there's this idea that we have these well-known ports so any port between 1 and 1024 essentially is considered well known which means if i see a port like port 80 that oh we know that port 80 that's used for http that's the the default port that's used for a web server for a web page or if you're going to the encrypted version you would go to port tcp 443 right those are commonly known ports so the idea is that people aren't supposed to use those ports for anything else than what they're commonly known for it doesn't mean that uh, normally right tcp 25 is used for email smtp to to send email but what if i put a web server on port 25 you can do that you can put pretty much any application on any port you want you just have to maybe make some adjustments to be able to reach it like in that case you have to take, tell your web browser not to go to port 80 or 443 by default but to go to port 25. it'll still work you just have to do the extra work to say hey go to port 25. realistically anything over 1024 is kind of wide open there's this idea sure there's registered ports and so they're associated with different applications but yeah 
and then say, and then there's free ports. Again, for me, everything over 1024 pretty much is open. You can do a Google search, and there's a couple of main pages on the internet that will uh, show you, a, you know, common applications with associated ports. But a lot of those still have dozens of applications associated with them. So it's not like a one-to-one -one relationship. So again, at that point, does it really matter if I put my own application on a port that 20 other applications are going to use as well? As long as they're not running on the same machine, there's no conflict. It's only when you try to run two applications using the same port, that's where, well, one's going to bind to the port and use it, and the other one's going to be like, eh, sorry, the port's not available. I'm not going to be able to work until you put it on something else. So we want to go through and find all of the different ports that are open on a system, right? If we're the thief walking down the neighborhood, we're looking for the houses, we're looking for you know, the windows, we're looking for the doors. Then we're starting to look at, well, what, you know, do, does it look like the, the windows cracked open or you know, maybe somebody left the garage door slightly open, right? Maybe the door is ajar so we can slip through. That's really what we're, we're looking for. So we'll take a step back and talk about, and I mentioned, right, there are differences between TCP and UDP. The idea is TCP is what we call a connection-oriented protocol versus UDP, which is connectionless. The idea is, and we use the example that if I want to send, it was talked about, I want to send a, say, Christmas card to my mom, who actually just until recently, she used to live in San Diego on the other side of the country. So if I wanted to send her a Christmas card, I would take it down to the post office, I get the letter or the, the card in the envelope, and I would address it, I put her her address on it, I put my address on it, and then I put a stamp on it, and then I would uh, drop it in the, the post office, in, in the mailbox. And I'm gonna assume that it's gonna to get to where it's going. Now, there's a million and one things that could go wrong between where I live in South Carolina on one side of the country and San Diego, where my mom used to live. She just moved here, actually. But I, she m might not ever get that letter. Right? That's the idea of UDP traffic. It's connectionless. We just put packets out there with an address, right? We say, this is where it's going. Get it there but we don't have an idea of if it actually ever gets there or not. If I want to make sure my mom gets that Christmas card, I can go to UPS or FedEx, and then I can order the post office and I can ask for a return receipt. So I get guaranteed delivery. So when they drop it off at my mom's house, I even get a picture, right? Here's the, the letter at your mom's house, or here, your mom actually signed for this, right? There's a return receipt, so I know without a certainty of a doubt that she got it. That's TCP. So when we say connection-oriented protocol, it means there's a return receipt. There's guaranteed delivery. Where UDP has no such guarantee. But because we're not, we don't have this extra overhead doing the guarantees, it actually makes UDP very fast. So when we talk about sending large amounts of data, we like to use UDP because it's much faster than TCP. So when we're doing something like streaming Netflix and we have billion, billions and billions of packets, and you know what, if I lose one or two packets, it's not a big deal. It's not gonna stop the show from, from playing. The human eye is not gonna notice a difference on the TV that a couple of packets were dropped. And so it's much quicker to use UDP for, th for things like streaming. TCP, when we talk about that connection-oriented protocol, right? it is reliable, it is slower, but it has its place, sometimes especially when we talk more about security usually. And part of the reason when we talk about having that connection-oriented protocol or how we get this idea of guaranteed delivery, it comes because of the three-way handshake. And so the three-way handshake looks like this, where if I have my computer, let's say on the left-hand side, and I want to talk with, let's say this, this web server on the right-hand side. 
So before I can just have my web browser open up a web page from the server, my computer actually has to go to the server on the port that the website is running on and say, hey, I want to talk to you. That's why it sends that synchronization or that send packet. It says, hey, I want to talk to you. And then the server, it needs to send an acknowledgement back to say, hey, I want to talk or I'll talk with you. Right? So we send a send packet, say, I want to talk with you. And then the server is supposed to send an acknowledgement back, says, okay, I'll talk with you. The problem is, is when we set up that connection, that's, that only allows the client on the left to send data to the server on the right. It doesn't allow the server on the right to send data to the client. It's a one-way connection. So when two computers talk to each other over TCP, we have to set up two-way communication. So they realized back in the day, instead of sending you know, a send packet and an act packet for one way, and then the other way you would send another send packet and another acknowledgement or act packet, right, which would be four packets, that they took the, the two middle packets and combined those into one just to, to save some, some time and space, saves bandwidth. So now that client wants to transfer the web website, the web page, right? Sends a synchronization packet to, to the server, says, hey, I want to talk to you. The server sends the acknowledgement back saying, hey, I want to talk to you as well, or I'll talk with you as well. And then it also combines its send packet to say, hey, I want to talk with you. And then the client gets that and says, oh, okay, he's talking with me. Oh, and he wants to talk with me, <laughs> right? So one, he's going to receive my information, and then it's, oh, he wants to send me information as well, he or she. And then it'll take my computer and then send that final acknowledgement back to say, okay, I'll talk with you. So then we get two-way communication between these hosts. Again, the idea is we could have done that with a four-way handshake, a sin, an act, a sin, an act, but... Why not just combine that send and act packet into one? So we just save the time and bandwidth. So that's the idea of the three-way handshake. Now, the three-way handshake becomes important when we talk about Nmap because that's what Nmap uses to determine when ports are open or if they're closed or if they're filtered by a firewall when we're talking about testing TCP ports. And packets can have different flags. So the sin is a type of flag, the ACK or the acknowledgement, that's another type of flag. And there's others like urge or push, which you could see, these are more kind of old school when you used to have really slow networks, both trying to you know, push in urgent traffic or push it through to, to make it go faster. So usually you'll see sin, ACK. So you'll start seeing these as we go through some of the Wireshark captures later on. But then, and then there's also the fin and the reset. So this is for when, well, we're done talking. You know, oh, I've got my website. You know, I loaded the web page. I've I've got what I needed out of you. So thanks. Take care. And we go ahead and close down that that connection. So that's where we'll see other flags like fin and and reset. So there's a sin scan that we have in Nmap, right? Which is the the kind of the default Nmap scan that we have now where they talk about this half open scan. Because what happens is that, let's say here I am, and I'm doing a port scan on this server. And so I'll go ahead and send a send packet to port one, say, hey, I want to talk to you. If that port is open, the computer will come back and say, okay, yeah, let's talk. And I want to talk with you too. And so at that point, we have the information we're trying to get. Right? We know in this case, port one is open. And then maybe I'll try port two and three, four, five, six, until I get, oh, port 80. Oh, port 80 sends me a SYNAC. So I know, okay, port 80 is open. Again, I'm not trying to load a web page off of port 80. I just want to see if it's open or not. So at this point, I know the port's open or not. So we're done. From a port scanning perspective, we're done. We don't have to send the acknowledgement. I got the information we need, right? I know that the port's open. 
So that's why they call it a half open scan because we never send the final acknowledgement. We know the port's open. That's all we came for. So we're done. We're moving on. Port's open. We win at this point. Now, the full SIN scan, right, and the idea here is, right, if I send the SIN packet and what happens when I get a reset act back from the server that I'm scanning, what this means is that, well, the port's closed. So what happens is the SIN packet actually got to the server and the server processed it and the server says, oh, hey, you're testing port one. Nothing's running on port one. So it sends that reset acknowledgement back saying nothing here is running on port one. So again, there's there's two things that happen at that point. Is again, we know we're communicating with the server because the send packet got there and it sent us a reset act back. So we know we have two-way communication with the server and we know the port's closed. So again, we're trying to scan, are the ports open or closed? Well, in this case now, we know the port's closed. So again, it's another one where we win. The other combination we see is, well, what happens if there's a firewall? And whether it's a network-based firewall, it's a host-based firewall that's blocking traffic. Because if you think, if I send a SIN packet to test a port and the firewall blocks the traffic, then I never get a response back. I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. So if I don't get any type of response back, then we just realize, okay, the port's filtered. There's a firewall blocking us. Or maybe it was some just really freaky network connection that just went bad at that one particular point in time. But let's say all the time, right, it's, it's going to be, oh, there's a firewall in the way. So the three options we have is when we scan a port, if we send a send packet and get a send act back, it means, oh, yeah, that port's open. Good. Okay, we know we have a target. We have a window or a door that could potentially allow us to get into the house. Remember, if I see a reset act that comes back, in that case, it means right, the port's closed. Because we're talking with the server. We said, hey, we're just checking. We want to talk to port one. And the server just comes back and says, hey, port one's closed. There's nothing here. Like, okay, that's, hey, you know what? That's all we wanted to know, open or closed. Remember, the third alternative is if we send a send packet and there's a firewall blocking that traffic, we never get a response. So after an amount of time, we'll just say, okay, we're gonna, we haven't got a response back. We're not going to wait anymore. We're just going to say, hey, yep, you know what? That, that port is filtered. It means there's a firewall somewhere between our computer and the target we're scanning. Right, so we get closed, open, filtered. So we can do these default scans. We can pick one of these systems that we have in the home lab. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and scan. I mean, they're all kind of the same. Now I can scan. 192, say, .168.100.100, oops, or sorry, 200. So this is the click PLC that we have in the lab. Again, it doesn't tell us much. We don't see any open ports. We don't see any closed, or, well, we, we see a 1,000 closed ports. And what this means is by default, I'm kind of go back to this slide. I'm kind of jumping ahead. By default, Nmap scans the most common 1,000 ports. So Theodore had a project once upon a time where he scanned the entire internet with Nmap. And then he took all of those results and then just went through and determined, you know, which port was seen the most on the internet. He just put them all in order. So it's like, oh, okay, so we can come up with this idea of what are the top 1,000 commonly used ports. Remember, on the internet, not, not internal networks. So by default, it only scans for 1,000, the top 1,000 ports. So that's what we're seeing here is, hey, I scanned the top 1,000 ports and didn't find anything. 
Now, just remember, there's 65,535 ports. So just because we don't find anything with the default top 1,000, it doesn't mean that there's not something there. So we can tell it to scan all TCP ports if we want. So we can use the dash P dash switch is usually what I do, because that's the one that Fyodor talked about when I saw him at DEF CON a long time ago, before it was a documented feature. So you can say, okay, scan all 65,535 ports. It's going to take a second, or two, or 60. So now that the scan completed, and we scan all 65,535 ports, we do see that there is one port identified as open. So we see TCP 502 open. Now, we can assume we know what that's normally associated with it. Or some of you might not, but we'll find out, well, how how do we know what, what's running on that that port? Right? And, and we'll come back and, and we'll look at that in, in a second. And here, going back to the slide, this is where right, we're scanning all the ports. In this case, you can see an example, right, that's a Windows box that, that we're scanning. Or in this case, we know we're scanning a PLC. We'll just kind of, that was a side-by-side -side comparison. <laughs> so we can scan UDP ports. So instead of the, the normal default scan, we actually have to specify dash lowercase s, capital U. Now the problem with UDP is that UDP traffic is just sent. Remember, we put the mail in the mailbox and we assume it gets to where it's going. There is no three-way handshake because remember, we use that three-way handshake for guaranteed delivery. There's no guaranteed delivery in UDP. So because there's no three-way handshake, MAP doesn't have that, that real true functionality on how to determine if a UDP port is open or not. There are some tricks where it kind of can. So in this case, you can see if it sends UDP traffic to a port that's not open, it should get an ICMP port unreachable message back from the server or the target. Should, but might or, or might not. And we could use that to determine the port is closed, right? And anything else would be considered open or filtered, or that the server is just not responding. So and that's it. So when you try to scan UDP, it, you can kind of get an idea, but one is you're only going to scan a handful of ports and mostly because it takes an extremely lot of time because UDP just you have to sit there and wait and wait and wait to see if you ever get that ICMP port unreachable message to tell you that the port's closed and then otherwise you say oh it's open or filtered well there's a big difference between is a port open or is it filtered by a firewall right? those are completely two different things So UDP, you're going to scan a few ports, but you're not going to scan for everything. But here's an example of scanning a, it's a, a Windows machine, right, for UDP, because it does have UDP, you see things like, like for DNS, right? When you do a DNS lookup to resolve a, a name to an IP address, that's over UDP 53. So UDP traffic does have its place. And you will see it in certain instances and even in control system environments. And, and we'll see a couple of examples. And here's some different ways on how we can scan like entire subnets, which we're doing. You can see you can scan individual IP addresses or maybe a sub range, like everything between .1, .1 and, and 100. There's a few things for you to, to play with there, like, oops. You can also import a list, a text list of host. So, and I've used this, I use this actually a lot of times. Maybe I get a list of vulnerable hosts out of maybe an Excel spreadsheet and it has a hundred hosts and then I want to put them into Nmap to do additional scans to really determine what, what type of host these are. So you can do that. So this is a really nice trick. You can also, you can exclude certain hosts. Maybe I have one host that I know that if I scan it, it'll crash. So I'm always going to exclude that, right? In this case, don't scan 1.32. Scan everything else in that 192.168.1 range. Just don't scan 
192.168.1.32. You can scan an entire subnet, which we've already been doing. Right? We say nmap, and then we give it the subnet range insider notation, right? which is the slash followed by the subnet mask. And we'll scan everything in that entire 192.168.1 range. Nice thing also is there's the dash dash open option, which I guess kind of gives away, well, what's running on port 502? <laughs> but we'll come back. The idea is if you're scanning at large range, and maybe in this case I'm saying, hey, I'm only scanning for instances of Modbus on 502. But if I scan an entire range, every time I'm I hit a, a host that doesn't have Modbus running, it sends me a, ho a, a message back that says closed. Close, 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 close. And then you see, oh, open. Close, 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 close. It's like, well, I just want to see what's open. So that's the dash dash open. Just show me where the open ports are. So when you're especially scanning larger ranges, that makes it very nice and very clean. So just something to, to think about. Oops. Kind of jumping ahead. Because the one thing that's left off here is, well, what we're seeing here is the service scan. So if I go back to our window, right, and it's like, oh, okay, I know something's running on port 502. So there's a couple of things that we can do here. One is I can go back to our nmap command now instead of saying, oh, scan all the ports or scan the top 1,000 common, I can say just, just, just scan port 502 because it looks like that's the only port running on TCP. So I want to run just port 502. And I'm going to use what they call the service scan in Nmap. So I can use dash lowercase s capital V as in Victor. And what that does, so now it's only going to test to see if 100.200 has port 502 open. And then it's going to do additional checks to tell me what is actually running on that port. So we know port 502 is open, but now it's going to come back and say, before we saw MBAP. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Modbus something, but I don't know. And I'm not going to make an assumption. I want to check because somebody could put like a web server running on 502. But in this case, oh, okay, it's Modbus over TCP IP. Awesome. So this definitely now, even more so, looks like, yeah, it's, it's a PLC. Well, if we want to take it to the next level, what we can do is we can run that service scan again, but we can also do what they call a script scan. So we do dash lowercase s, capital C, as in Charlie. So now it's going to run some additional tests on top of the service scan to see if it can get any other information from that port. Now in this case, by default, we don't see anything else, right? So at this point, we found the port. We know we verified it's Modbus TCP. Now, Nmap also has, uh, and we, we tried the scripting engine. It didn't come up with anything by default. Now, there's also individual scripts that you can run. So there's one for Modbus specifically. We're going to change that dash s capital C. We're going to change that to just say dash dash script. And then we're going to type in Modbus dash discover dot NSE, which is the name of this Modbus script. There's, there's other scripts as well, and we're going to look at some a little bit later on. Uh, and you can see, then it comes back with, well, here's the slave ID, and I know Modbus still is, is this hierarchy based off of master-slave model. We're trying to get away from that because of the, the racist uh, connotation but or meaning. Um, but for now, it's like, okay, here's another piece of information about this host. And we could use that, again, gather, gather more information that helps us successfully attack that, in this case, that, that PLC. Right? So, again, that probably doesn't mean a lot yet, but again, it's just another piece of the puzzle.
So I think we are transitioning from building asset registers to penetration testing, though. So I'm going to try and reel us, reel us back. But So that gets us through the active scanning portion as far as looking for hosts on the network using a scanning tool like Nmap, right? Finding ports, finding, and really from building asset registers perspective, it's about, well, what's running on those ports? Do we get information about what service, what version of that service or application is running, right? So, so that way, again, it helps us build out that asset register. So let's go ahead now and, and let's kind of switch gears and we're going to talk about passive sniffing or passive listening. Okay, so and you, you can see earlier we talked about passive scanning, but again, we're not scanning anything. I hate that term. So we're really talking about passive listening, sometimes passive, passive sniffing. We're talking about sniffing of, of packets. And the idea is that we're sitting in the network with network connectivity where we have visibility to see packets moving over the wire and that we can capture that traffic. So again, yeah, we're not scanning anything. We're not generating packets and putting anything on the wire. So this is safe to be able to do. The only time this isn't safe is when you unplug the wrong things or you pull the power on, on a network switch or you know the network goes down. That, but just from a passive listening or packet sniffing perspective, again, we're not generating traffic to put on the network. So there's no chance of breaking anything from, from that perspective. So, and we've already talked about using Wireshark in the in the course. So we can use Wireshark as a tool. We're going to open it up. Or actually, I guess we already have one instance open up. But we can open up a new one. Right. In this case, the uh, Ethernet adapter, the killer Ethernet adapter, is is the one that's connected to the the home, the research lab. So I can just double click on that, and then let me go ahead and blow this up a little bit so it's a little bit easier to. A little bit easier to see. And then we can see, maybe that's too big, the traffic as it comes through. And again, right now, I'm not seeing any TCP IP traffic, right? Whereas if you were in an IT network, you'd see tons of TCP IP traffic and very little anything else. Where now you can see multicast traffic labeled as LLDP, which we're going to come back and talk about. Oh, and now we're starting to see, oh, there's some ICMP. We can actually see some version 6 traffic. If we want, we can go ahead. Well, I can generate some traffic if I want. All right, so why don't I go ahead and can I ping that first PLC that's on the network? Oh, yeah, I'm getting the response back. And you can actually see there's the, in pink, there's the ICMP echo request and the ICMP reply. Remember, we, had, we did that four times. So we have four sets of ICMP echo requests and, and echo replies. We're seeing some ARP traffic like we were talking about earlier. Remember the broadcast traffic? And then everything else, again, we start to see it's not TCP IP traffic. But what we're seeing is other forms of communication from these PLCs. And then if I start looking at them, let me go ahead and stop this capture. So now we can see based off of the MAC address, remember Wireshark is going to translate that first half of the MAC address for us. So we do see Siemens, right? Which that lines up with what we saw in the Nmap scan earlier, because that Siemens PLC is running TCP IP, but it's also running other protocols, industrial control protocols, just not TCP IP. And then we can see, oh, there's another PLC out there, number four. We said well, kind of it's the ghost in the machine. So it's from Phoenix Contact. Now it's not running TCP IP. It's just running other industrial control protocols like Profinet. Remember Dell, that's our engineering workstation imaginatively named new laptop. <laughs> and I think that's all we're seeing here. We're not seeing any uh, other traffic from the, the click PLC. 
So there's a lot we can see and a lot of information that's being shared because they're actually trying to kind of announce information about each other. Right? If I open up this one packet, right, we can see that you know, this is, again, coming from that, that Siemens. And if you can read through this, we can get the idea of the name of the PLC. We can then, and we can see, of course, the vendor. We can see the where it starts to get into the, the kind of the software or model type. The model really actually is that CPU 1200 down below, right? We can see then things like hardware version, firmware version. Uh, it's probably, probably the serial number on the device, right? This is all information that's advertised in the clear. This is not encrypted traffic. Most traffic in OT environments is not encrypted. And that's not a bad thing. People in IT always cringe. We have to encrypt everything to keep it safe. Not necessarily in OT. And for me, I, I love it when it's unencrypted because it makes network intrusion detection so much more easier. So I don't have to worry about capturing traffic and then breaking the traffic, breaking the encryption to be able to read the trap, the packets to see, you know, is there malicious traffic in there or not. So that's actually a really nice advantage of not having traffic encrypted. I'm a big proponent in most, in most environments, not using encryption. Now there's some, you know, mission critical or super secret sensitive proprietary information formula or process that, that the business is worried about an attacker stealing, then you're going to encrypt. Otherwise, if it's no risk to physical safety, environmental safety, or the availability of the plant, why do it? Especially if it's going to give us, it's going to benefit us more so in the long run. But if you want to see, in fact, we can go ahead, I think if I have this open, uh, doesn't look like it, but I can. So we can open up the TA uh, portal, which is the Siemens software. So in this case, since we were just talking about the, the Siemens software, we can go ahead and, and open this up. And you'll see what, and most, at least the ones I'm familiar with, most of the client software that we use for configuring PLCs, it has this option. In this case, it, we go down to online and diagnostics. And Basically, it has an option basically to go out on the network and find, in this case, Siemens PLCs. And so we can go ahead and you can, oh, we're going to go start search. And you can see we selected right the right network interface. And so it's sending out traffic to see if it can find any devices talking, in this case, probably over Profinet. And you can actually see it comes back with two. And so we can see, oh, well, here's our Siemens PLC at 192.168.100.200. And, oh, there's that other fourth PLC. And, oh, it does have an IP address assigned. It's just on a different subnet, which is why we're not seeing it right now. We see, oh, it's 192.168. 1.230, not 100.230. But it also still has that other traffic that it can use to talk on the local network. So it kind of did it on purpose. So that way it's, it's hidden, but we can still find it on the network. And again, that's another one. And I've seen many instances of this in the real world. So this is another example of building that Sudoku puzzle. And there's other options, right, we have. But this is how we can work with a PLC. So if you've ever never connected to a PLC through its client software, this, this is pretty, pretty standard. And this is kind of similar to the other packages that are out there. There's usually an option for something like Flash LED. So that way, if you had a technician or you were, you know, you were going to try to program that PLC and you're in there and you have 100 Siemens PLCs, well, which one maybe do I need to connect directly into? So you can say, oh, flash the LED on this one PLC. And then when you're standing there, you can see, oh yeah, this is the one. 
Or if I want, I can go ahead and I can connect to it. And then when I connect to it, it takes a second. But you'll see once it loads, then we can get into things like, oh, I want to go ahead and be able to program the PLC. Or maybe I want to go ahead and make you know basic changes to the PLC. Right. And here's where you can also see this will go what we were talking about earlier. Is it in run mode? Where you hopefully it's read only and you can't make any changes. Right. In this case it's not, but let's let's go ahead and put it in run mode. And you can just see it, it takes a second. And it actually already has PLC programming. So now that PLC programming, that code is running. It's doing its job, it's monitoring, it's, it's going to make changes in the environment if it needs to. And I can't make changes, at least to the firmware, unless I go into stop mode. Right? So the Siemens the SL2200, this is one of those PLCs, very common, but it doesn't have a physical key switch or dip switch on the outside to control. It's just software. It's just literally you would connect with it through the TIA portal and then go in here and click stop. And then when you click on stop, that will actually bring it bring it down. And now I could do something like upgrade the firmware. But OK, we'll go ahead and turn it back on. <laughs> So it just gives you a high level intro. Again, if it's something you haven't seen before, I think it, the first time you see it, it's really cool, especially the first time you play with it. That's the other thing when I I like the, you know, I suggest if anybody, if you have the time, the resources to go ahead and get a PLC, the best one you can start with is the Click PLC from Automation Direct. Because fully loaded, it's 400 US dollars, which you're not going to find a better deal, even trying to buy something off of eBay. You're just not. Um, and they have a lot of training for it, and all their software is free. And it's really intuitive. So it's fairly straightforward to use. But here's kind of the same process that we saw with the Siemens software. So, it, oh, it broadcasts to see are there any click PLCs out on the network and you see, oh yeah, here it found one. And again, it tells us all this information about itself. In this case, it even says, hey, I'm in run mode and I'm all good. And so I can go ahead and connect to it. Now in this case, I actually assigned a password for this one. You can see the Siemens one did not have a password by default and it still doesn't have one assigned to it. I have to remember my password. And then uh, in this case, we're going to just tell it, OK, use the project code that's on the PLC. This is the ladder logic, very simple, just to make sure that I had something to get the PLC up and running. And just like in the Siemens, you know, I have the ability to go in and if I want, I can stop it. I can put it in stop mode. I can make changes to the programming code if I wanted to. And this is what really most of what the, the rest of this interface is. So especially if you're new to OT, like I, I'm still, I was talking actually with an engineer today and he was asking, you know, what people would think if you come from IT cybersecurity, really basic questions about uh, firewalls. And at the same time, he's like, yeah, I'd, you know, I feel stupid asking these questions. He's like, you know, cause I've been programming PLCs for 20 years and, and DCS. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's, but I've been doing firewalls for 20 years and I've, you know, I just program PLCs on the side when, when I have time <laughs> and I'm just learning. So yeah, it's, it's, it's give and take. So it's kind of interesting conversation. But again, if it's not something that you've seen before, it's really interesting. Again, I always suggest if, if you have the time, the want and, and the money to, Get the get a, a click PLC, um, and then you can program that and get started with that, and and then kind of build your home lab from there. But yeah, it's unfortunately it's not cheap to have like a physical you know asset to have a physical PLC, unfortunately. So uh, and and there are lesser alternatives so you can do it with our arduinos or um with uh raspberry pis it's it's just 
and they're great alternatives. It's just not the same of having a true PLC. So I definitely suggest doing the the full PLC if you can. So, but enough of that. I've I've totally derailed us. <laughs> Because what we were talking about was using Wireshark packet captures to find hosts on the network, right? And, the, and so we kind of went down a rabbit hole, but you also got the idea of how we started finding these PLCs. And we even found one PLC that wasn't talking TCP IP on the lab network, but it was still talking a protocol on the network, right? And so that's what we're really trying to do with those. Now, um, when I was when I first put this class together, I didn't have the big lab or well, the quote unquote big lab. I only had one PLC before, um, so I was using different pocket captures that I would download from GitHub repositories on the internet. So there's this ITI one. I mentioned this actually earlier in the course, which is great. Um, so you can go and and there's tons of captures for different industrial control protocols. So definitely play with those in, in Wireshark. Um, to get get an idea. But what we can go back and do is Wireshark has all of these great features or menu options. So that way, if I go up to um, statistics, and then there's a couple of these that we would look for. So typically the one, especially if I'm starting and I'm trying to build an asset register after packet capture information, or I'm gonna I'm gonna go to endpoints. And so you can actually see if now here's Ethernet addresses, so that's MAC addresses. Let's say, you know, we're gonna make it simple, and I'm I just want to look for IP addresses, just IP version four IP addresses right now. So out of all that traffic that was captured, we see one, two, three, four, five, six IP addresses. Now the last four IP addresses, like those are all multicasting addresses. That's, that's a lot of the other industrial control protocols that we are seeing talking, sharing information, but not TCP IP. So we actually only have, we see traffic from dot 100, which is the engineering workstation, and we see traffic from 100.200, which is the click PLC. Now this brings up a great point because this capture that shows two IP addresses is only a capture at a certain point in time. So in OT environments, two assets, right, they might never talk or they might talk once a month or once a week. So in that environment, we know, oh, well, we have four, four, fuck, I can't, can't, can't talk right now, four hosts that we should see over TCP IP if they were all talking. But again, they're not all talking right now. Now, if I did a scan, we would see a lot more pop up, right? Because that would generate some, some talk or conversation between those hosts. But just keep in mind that that packet capture is only good for that slice of time and that OT devices by default, right? They're, they're not constantly talking. They are not Windows machines, right? They're not chatterboxes, not on TCP IP. We can see otherwise, right? In the background over LLDP where they're just multicasting all the information about themselves. <laughs> like I'm here, I'm here. Here's, here's all my information. It's almost like steal my identity. Please, they're begging us to. But you can use that endpoints option to go in and see, show, show me the, all the IP addresses. And you can see it, sure, it, had, it was showing MAC addresses. So that we're seeing more of, right, than just IP addresses. Because remember, those machines are out there and they're not, not talking TCP IP, but they are connected to the network and they are talking. If there's IP version 6 traffic, we'll see that as well. And then you'll see if there's any TCP or UDP traffic right here. Now we're seeing the IP addresses and the ports. So the ports is where you know, we want to see if we see anything like, oh, a port 502. Or and here we see like 5353, so MDNS, multicast DNS, or, um, but then the there's some kind of random high order ports, which probably don't mean anything. 
So that's endpoints. There's other options as well. So we can look at conversations. So it's like, oh, okay, now show me who's talking with who. So if I go back and I see, okay, 192.168.100.100 is talking with 100.200, right? So that's our engineering workstation talking with the click PLC. We can see the engineering workstations also doing a lot of multicasting. <laughs> We can see how much trans data is transferred between the two. So you can see not a lot, very minimal. You can see the, the different directions, how much was sent to and from. You can see, again, there's IP version 6 traffic, and if there's any TCP traffic, which we don't see any, and then there's oh, UDP traffic. Because a lot of that, especially the broadcast traffic between an engineering workstation and a PLC is, is done over UDP. So we have that, and then we can also look at the protocol hierarchy. Always find it interesting. Not necessarily for, usually for building asset registers, we've probably got as much information already out of the packet capture as we're going to. Um, but in this case, we can see all the protocols that are talking and how much, what percentage. So we can see, yeah, the biggest one is that that link layer discovery protocol, LLDP. We saw all the PLCs using to, again, advertise, hey, I'm here. There's all this information about me. And then yeah, we saw some UDP traffic. So there's a couple of things that, that we can find from, from that. And there's some some other ones that are in there, but those are the those are the big ones, especially when we talk about looking for building asset registers. We're going to talk a lot more about Wireshark when we get into the intrusion detection section. But again, we just kind of wanted to kind of, you can start to see at this point how you can capture traffic in the OT network. Again, we're not active scanning. We're not putting any network packets on the network. So there's no, nothing at risk. And right, we're just looking or reviewing that information to see what's out there. Okay, now you might have limited visibility and don't forget, you have to capture traffic over a long period of time because in OT, it's not like in IT, right? The, the systems aren't just constantly talking to each other, at least, again, over TCP IP. Here you can see these PLC, PLCs trying to continually talk with each other, you know, say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. It's just not over TCP IP. All right. So that's what we were talking about there. So there's the slides. Uh, Network Miner, I just want to mention you know, real quickly, is, is an alternative out there um, that you can use. The cool thing I like about Network Miner, uh, Miner is you see it, it's a little different view as far as what hosts are out there. It tries to guess what type of host. It's not an OT tool, though, so don't it, don't. You know, it's not going to put like PLC on there or anything. Um, but if there's any type of files that are transferred in that network traffic, like a Word document or a picture file or a web page, it extracts all of that and puts them on your hard drive to read, which is really, really cool. So it's more for, for IT, but it can kind of come in handy in, in OT environments as well. And there's a free version and there's a paid for version. So, um, you know, definitely always check it out. Always, you know, we're, you know, definitely love to use free software. So, uh, and here you see, yeah, you, as you expand those, it tries to give you more information about each host. Um, so it's definitely a little different as Wireshark, not as powerful as Wireshark in any stretch of the imagination. But the few things that Wireshark doesn't do well, it does really well. Um, and I think that's kind of how they made their name. It's like, okay, we're going to do everything that people, the, the few things that people don't like about Wireshark, we're going to do them and we're going to do them well. And that's, I guess that's their claim to fame, honestly. So last but not least, to kind of wrap everything up, and we've already started talking about this earlier. Once we have built out the asset register, and maybe again, it's not 100% complete, but it's as complete as we're going to get it. Remember, it's like, what can an attacker do if they got the asset register? And that's it's the treasure map. It's the blueprint for here's the plan on how to break into the environment. So you want to make sure that attackers aren't able to access the asset register wherever we store it. 
So if we're storing it, let's say on a system, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on within the, the organization, whether it's on, on site, maybe it's on the IT network and not the OT network. It's maybe not a bad idea or you have it on both. Because we do have to make sure we get access to it if we're you know, on the OT network doing things like incident response or security monitoring. But wherever it goes, right, we want to make sure we harden the system against attack. So use things like go to the Center for Internet Security uh, and get the hardening guidelines for the operating system for that system that you're the server or the host that you're you're storing it on. So if it's for a Windows server or a Windows workstation or or if it's a Linux host or a Linux work, you know, it's go get the the system hardening guidelines and make sure you lock down that machine. Make it as secure as possible. Remember, we don't want an attacker getting this blueprint to how to attack the environment. You can consider encrypting it. Right? So even if it's just an Excel spreadsheet, yeah, put the put the password on it to encrypt it. Just make sure, this is where we want to make sure everybody knows what the password is because we don't want somebody getting locked out in, when, in the heat of the moment where they really need access to the asset register, where it could even potentially save a life. The last thing we want is a password on Excel spreadsheet uh, preventing us from saving somebody's life. And I know that sounds silly, but at the same time, that's kind of the conversation we have in OT. Because everything ultimately comes down to is, is saving lives. Protecting lives, the environment, and then we can talk about uptime or availability of, of the environment. You can put access control, so things like permissions determine who has access to it. You can put it in physic, make sure it's physically secure. So wherever, whatever server or system that it's residing on, make sure it's it's locked up and people just can't get to it. So hopefully it's a server like in the data center, maybe off the engineering room or the control center. We're just talking about one location today where they actually have the control room on the second floor and the data center's on the, the floor beneath them. So for certain tasks, they actually have to leave the control room to go into the data center down one floor. I thought that was really strange. It's a it was a outside party. It's not related to my my day job, but that was very very strange. Um, and then, what other things should we consider? Those are some of the that you know the high high level ones. Uh, some people might consider keeping it offline. I think personally, if you're you're in a physically secure location, which a lot of OT environments typically are, or not not all, but I say to, especially larger ones probably typically are, are better. Um, but you you can have it printed out and sitting on your desk if if you have really good you know physical security and keeping people from coming in. But you make sure if you have it printed out on your desk that when you're not there, you put it at least in maybe a locking file cabinet or, you know, protect it in, uh, physically for when you're, or you're not there. So, so things to, things to consider. Of course, we want to make sure that the asset register is updated over time. So we have a process weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, where we're going through and making sure there it's updated. Probably I would say no more uh, don't wait for longer than, you know, every quarter or three months. Don't wait to do it every year. That's crazy. Maybe, or, you know, once a month, right? So that way you capture minimal changes and it doesn't take all the time. If you're only doing it once a year, you're going to hate doing it. So a lot of this plays into the change management procedures at site. So when somebody makes a change, it should go through change management and get authorization before right, you're swapping out parts or putting in new, new assets or taking out old assets. So make sure, and we're going to talk more about this when we get into things like incident detection response. Because again, when we do incident detection response and we get alerts, 99% of the time, it's not a hacker or malicious activity. It's someone doing operations and maintenance and maybe they didn't go through the authorized change management procedures or channels right so it's we don't normally have a high sense of paranoia in ot as much as in in the it world right and 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 that's and that's fair we still still should have some paranoia though so little little paranoia is good 
So again, we're going to come back and, and talk about that more. And that's where we get into going all the way full circle to the beginning of the section. Again, why I'm such a firm believer in asset registers, where it sounds like it's so boring because all we're talking about is asset inventory. But that asset inventory, especially in OT environments, it allows us to do threat and vulnerability management, and it allows us to do incident detection and response. And those are the two biggest things outside of network architecture that we can do to protect the environment. And all of those are based off of the asset register. So having the asset register is critical. And that's why we were talking about it. So I appreciate everybody's time. I also kind of a, another big section, but hopefully everybody found it interesting. I know we took a few side tangents, but uh, if you have questions, comments, concerns, you can comment on the video. If you like it, you know, Give me a thumbs up, um, you know, subscribe if, if you haven't subscribed to the channel anymore, but you can feel free to reach out to me. There's my email address. You can always ping me on LinkedIn. Uh, and then, of course, you know where the YouTube channel is because you're watching this, so you don't need it there. But anyways, I appreciate everybody's time and, and coming and watching the video. And uh, we'll have uh, part six out in a couple of days where that's when we'll actually get into threat and vulnerability management. So that's one of my other favorite sections. So I'll uh, see everybody soon. All right, take care.